Now let's look at a demo showing how we can run load tests both interactively and by using the task scheduler. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and look at how we can run a load test both interactively as well as from the command line or on a scheduled basis. We're not going to spend too much time looking at all the various details of how to use the load test while it's running. We covered a lot of that in the first module in the 11th clip if you want to go back and review how that stuff works. In this case, we're going to look at how to start the load test, and then we're also going to see how we can debug a running load test, and that's it. So from the load test menu, you can see that you have two options. You can either run a test or debug the test. If you run the test, it will simply start the test and you'll get a window, something like this. It'll remember your last preferences for how many of the various things to show. So in this case, it's showing one panel. By default, it likes to show things in this four panel grid. And you'll be able to monitor the test as it runs. In this case, this test is gonna run for two minutes. I don't want you to have to watch it for two minutes, so we'll fast forward a bit. All right, so now the test is starting to wrap up. One other thing you can do in interactive mode here is you can turn off different counters you're not interested in. You can even delete them from the uh, different panels here. Or you can go and add things to the panels that you're interested in. For instance, if I wanted to see, if I wanna go into one of these graphs, even after it's completed or while it's running, you can go and you can add different counters directly and see their effects on a given panel. But now let's see how we can go ahead and debug a load test. To do that, we simply run it and say debug the test. And if you don't have any breakpoints set, everything will work just as it did before. So you can see our test is beginning to collect data. Now, if I want to see what exactly is going on in my test, I can jump into the system under test. In this case, we're running these unit tests. And I could add a breakpoint right here, and you'll see it's immediately hit because the load test is going on. Now, while we're in that breakpoint, if we look at our test, it's still running, and it's still collecting data. So you'll see things like my CPU load are no longer running very hard and heavy because I've got the debugger attached and we're stopped at the moment. Now, if I come back to my unit test and clear that breakpoint, I can examine what it's saying here. It's saying it was 1233.17, but then I can just rerun. Now my load test will pick back up. And unfortunately, when you do something like this, you've pretty much invalidated this particular load test's aggregate results, but you can have a look at what's going on with the behavior of the system at a particular point in time within that load test, which can be useful. Another thing that you can do, and for this we'll jump into another project, is run a load test to see how specific changes affect the performance of your application in real time. Now again, these kinds of tests typically don't have much value in the aggregate because the average number of tests per second and things like that will be skewed by the fact that you're messing with the system under test during the load test but they can be useful in terms of demonstrating something. So if you have to give a presentation, these can be much more compelling than just showing somebody some static charts that don't move. Let's look at a simple web project that connects to a local database and show some of the effects of caching and other tweaks to that particular application. So for this test, what I've done is I've added a new web project to this same solution, Test Project 2 and I've changed the default.aspx page. Let's look at the source. I've added a simple data grid, and I've added a SQL data source that talks to my local Northwind database and runs a select star from products query. That's all I've changed. I've also set the web project to be the one that runs on startup, and now let's see what happens when we run this. So you see we get the results here. Now if we view the source of this page, one of the things that you'll note is that it's a classic data grid. And what that means is that it's got view state turned on by default. And since we've grabbed a rather large table, we have a rather large amount of view state. This is something that we can easily optimize. And view state, of course, is much less of a problem in ASP.NET 4. But for the purposes of our demo to show how a load test can be used at runtime to show off the effects of a performance tweak, we're going to go ahead and leave that view state turned on for now. So let's create a load test now that runs against this web application. We're just going to add a quick web performance test. We've seen how these work a few times now. 
Then we'll delete the fav icon and run the test to verify it works. Looks good. Next we need to go ahead and add a load test and we're going to want to add a SQL counter to it. So we're going to add a load test, go to our test mix and add just that web test. And under counter sets, we're going to make sure we add our local host. And we really care about the SQL. We'll add ASP.NET just for good measure. Finish. Now we can run this test. And we're going to want to take a look at the SQL. So let's bring this to one panel and go grab a SQL counter here called batch request per second. It's under the SQL statistics here at the bottom. Just drag that over. And the thing that we really care about here, we got zero errors, so we're going to go ahead and just stop watching that. And user load's not going to change. It's just 25, so we'll stop watching that as well. So we've got pages per second running about 316, and batch requests per second, that's our database request, running about 316. So you can see these two are pretty much running together. And we want to see if we can increase our page performance. So the first thing we might do when we come to our page is we can change something like session state. That's one of those tweaks you can make for performance. If you turn it to false, that can give you a slight performance boost. So now we look back at our test and we'll see whether or not that particular change has much of an impact. And if it does, it probably won't be much. It might be on the order of 1% or something like that. Really, at this point, I think our database is our bottleneck, and that'll depend on the kind of machine that you're running on. But I think for my particular dev box, the uh, bottleneck is going to be the database and not something to do with session state. So not a very exciting change with that tweak. Let me come back here and let's check out what happens if we mess with the view state. Since we don't need view state, we can turn that off here as well and just say enable view state equals false save that change and again this is while it's being load tested we're making live changes to the page now we'll see that that in fact has a slight change we go from 316 or so up to let's wait for it to level out now it's running about 411 420 were the last counts that we got all right so that's a pretty significant boost we just added about 100 requests per second by simply making that one view state change. It's about a 30%, 33% increase in performance. And if you were showing this to management, you know they might get pretty excited about this big boost here to this new level. Although it seems to be uh, dropping down a bit now as the test continues. But still, a significant gain. This, this will go up and down some over time. So then the next thing we can show is, well, what would happen if we added some caching? Caching is one of my favorite features of ASP.NET. So we would just go in here and say less than percent at output cache duration this is how many seconds let's say we want to do it for a minute and then you have to add a vary by param in this case we aren't doing anything with our connect or with our query string so we don't need to have any kind of varying by query string parameters and we'll save that and see what effect it has so we were running around 360 or so and, and look at this that's our database request so our database request just fell through the floor you can see our last database request was zero per second, and our web request just shot up, and now they're running around 700. So we went from way down here, where we were at around 290, you know, 290, 300. Now we've shot up to around 600, as much as 700. Now it's coming back up. 653 was the last number. So that's quite a significant increase in performance now by taking some of that load off of the database. And you can imagine that if your database is being shared by other pages or even other applications, getting that number to drop from several hundred, a max of 430 requests per second down to zero, is pretty compelling. And this kind of a live load test is something that you can use to demonstrate, especially to project managers or, or your, your management team, how a particular performance change can have a dramatic impact on your application's performance. Now let's look at how we can schedule these types of load tests using the command line. I'm going to open up a Visual Studio 2010 command prompt from the start menu. And this will give me some path variables that I'm interested in. 
for instance, the MS test variable will be in my path. And now I want to change directories to where my project file lives. So once I've changed to my particular folder where I have my test project, I'm gonna go ahead and look at that batch file that I created. Maybe you saw that in the PowerPoint. So here we've got our run load test.bat. We look at that, you'll see that it just has one line and I'm specifying the complete path to my MS test. And then I'm setting the test metadata that I wanna run, which is test project 2vsmdi And I'm running the load tests test list. So we can look at what that looks like here real quick. Switching back to Visual Studio, you can view your test list by using the test view up here and specifying the test list editor. And under my list of tests, I have a load tests list and it simply includes all of my load tests. You can add additional tests to a particular test list by simply dragging them over onto that list. In this case, I just wanna have the load tests running there. So we'll minimize this and run our batch file which simply is run load test.bat. And when you run it, you'll see it loads the VSMDI file and then begins execution. Now, in this case, there's not much to see because it's gonna just run everything minimized. But when it's done, you'll have some test result files that you can open up in Visual Studio and see what the results of these tests were. This is a great way to run tests during off hours. So let me show you next how you can schedule these using the task scheduler in Windows, and then you'll be able to run these on the weekends or overnight without impacting other people that are using your system or without you having to waste time waiting for a load test to run during work hours. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control C to abort this test run. And then let's look at the task scheduler. So from the start menu, just type in task and you should see task scheduler pop up if you're running on Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008. The task scheduler should launch and look something like this once you run it. And within the library, you'll see a number of different things that may be already scheduled for you. Here, I've got my load tests, one that I've already set up. Let's look at its properties. So in this case, you can see some general information. I've got this set to run only when the user is logged on. Uh, obviously, if you want this to run on a server when you're not uh, logged on to it, you'll need to change that. You can also set the privileges here. Your trigger is where you can set the schedule. In this case, I have a, a one-time trigger that's set to run on 6-12-2011. You can change this. We can edit that to run. The current time is about 12.51 p.m., so we'll go ahead and set, now the 18th, uh, we'll set this to run at 12.53 p.m., Say OK, and we'll save it, and we'll keep looking at the properties. So that's our trigger. Now, this just popped up in my other screen here. So you can see that the, uh, the task scheduler did kick off, and it's now running. So we'll just minimize that while it runs. If we look at the triggers, of course, you can go and set these to run daily or weekly or monthly or what have you. You've got a lot of different choices for how these tasks should run. So you should certainly be able to have it work for your needs. The only other thing to note here is the uh, action. If you're using a batch file, there's a couple things you wanna note. One is that you specify the path here, and the second is that you do include the full path to whatever executable you're running in your batch file. That's important or else it probably won't work. And then it's helpful usually if you wanna set the folder to be the folder for it to start in, but make sure that you don't put any quotes in this folder path. If you include quotes, it will not work. So that's just a, a common gotcha that you wanna look out for. All right, so once the test runs, you can see right now, if we uh, refresh this, it should tell us that it's actually running. So you see the task is currently running. And then once that finishes, you should see something like this that says the operation completed successfully.